Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Join the conversation on our social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to another edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. I am your host, Ken M. Joining me in studio this week, it's the one and only Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. And joining us on a triumphant return to the winning side of the ball for his New York football giants, it is your coach, my coach, the coach, Coach Duffy. One and two has never looked so good. Yeah. Folks, we're going to get into that just a little bit later in the show, along with some more sports stories. So definitely join in the conversation on social media, hashtag ODPH. You can find all those links on OchoDuroParleyHour.com. Definitely join in the conversation because we got to interact with you about this. There's so much to talk about. We definitely want to get your sides of the story on this because we have to go right into our Locks and Leaps recap. Mm -hmm. Now, Pad, why don't you start us off as a wild week of NFL action? Yeah. So kick us off here. Uh, I'm going to start with my lock. I think we'll save our leap for the end because, well, <laughs> we all took the same leap. Yeah. Uh, my lock was the New England Patriots to defeat the New, New York Jets. Uh, did not cover the spread uh, thanks to a muffed punt and then a pick six from the rookie quarterback. Oh, a backdoor cover. Yep. Nothing kicks yep. you in the pants more. Yep. So uh, final score was 30-14. to 14. Uh, Luke Falk, uh, 12 of 22 for 98 yards passing. Uh, no touchdowns, one interception. Tom Brady, 28 of 42 for 306 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Coach? I, I mean, what else can you – I mean, you knew the Patriots were going to have a field day. I mean, that's why the spread was 22 points to begin with. I mean, they – unfortunately, the Jets don't have anything right now with Darnold out. You know, you would have thought that they probably would have gone out and maybe gotten somebody to help, you know, in the immediate future with really a timetable return of, you know, TBD – I know that they've said that it could be four weeks, but also right. I've seen anywhere four to six. I think mm. five, I think four is being generous. Yeah, yeah I think four, four is, is being, being generous too. Generous. So I mean, really, it's like you know, you think you would have probably signed a veteran to at least tie you over with a team that we all thought were in, you know, maybe a wild card position. Obviously, you're not going to win the division. You no, know, that's not going to happen. No, and the Patriots did the Patriot thing. You know, I mean, surprisingly, I thought they were going to absolutely dump it on them. Because that's what Bill yeah. Belichick loves to do with the Jets mm -hmm. anytime yeah. he gets a chance to. But, you know, he put in, he, he held everybody out, which is probably a right decision. Yeah. And, uh, you know, lived to fight another day. Yeah, no, I mean, it was a good game for them. Like I said, outs outside the muff punt and then the pick six by uh, Jarrett Stenham, the rookie, quarter rookie quarterback there. I mean, it was a good game. I mean, Le'Veon Bell, 18 carries for 35 yards, no touchdowns, averaged 1.9 yards per carry. I mean, they just held him in check. I, I bet you that muff punt, though, is eating at Belichick. Yeah, I mean that <laughs> that's that something that he does not take well to special team errors. I would say that big deal. I would say that and then pulling Brady and you know just cuz all right, you know the game it was clear and evident based on the stats that okay, the Jets aren't going to make a run and come back in this thing. You know, that's what they were thinking and then you know, all right, let's put the rookie in there, get him some reps and then he immediately goes in like, you know, three passes, completes two and then pick six. Yeah, it was an interesting game to say the least. The Jets, obviously, tons of uncertainty on their offensive side of the ball. Yeah. I mean, they need a quarterback, and in my opinion, they should go out and get Kaepernick at this stage I, they need without a quarter, question. They need a quarterback, and I would say they also need a wide receiver, and I know they traded for Demarius Thomas a couple weeks ago, but Demarius Thomas ain't on the field. I mean, I'm looking at the receiving. Uh, they had Braxton Berrios, I think is how you say the name, two catches, 29 yards. Le'Veon Bell, four catches, 28 yards. Jamison Crowder, two catches, 25 yards. Robbie, Anders, Robbie Anderson, three catches, 11 yards like. None of these guys are exactly striking fear in, in defensive coordinators. But you got to talk about who's throwing them the ball. Eh, yeah, that's you know true. What I mean? So, yeah, that's why. And, Ken, same thing. I thought they were going to go get Kaepernick. A lot of people that I'm friends with that are Jets fans thought the same thing, that Kaepernick would have been the avenue. Obviously, all the on-the-field or off-the-field garbage that you guys want, want and, or not want to talk about. Uh, that being said, I, I don't see how you don't go and get somebody to fill in right now. Mm. What, what's Matt Flynn doing these days? I, f I thought Holding a clipboard, probably. I yeah, thought probably. Uh, Metzenberger there, too, the kid yeah. out of LSU that they drafted and just left on the pine and pony. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but seriously, I mean, you gotta you have a team that is, is wild card. I mean, and with the way that their schedule goes, I mean, they easily could be staring 0-5 down the plank here. Oh, they're staring 0-6 down the plank yeah. because they're currently 0-3. Here's their next three opponents. They travel to Philly. Uh, they're on a bye week this week, excuse me. 
Uh, and then they travel week five. They travel to Philly. Uh, L. They play Dallas at home. L. They play New England at home. L. L. And then they travel down to Jacksonville. They, they got a chance at Jacksonville. Yeah. yeah. Well, but maybe. that's depending on if Jalen Ramsey's there or not. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty for that game. But going to what we've seen thus far, I mean, Luke Falk, they got him off the Miami practice squad, if I'm not mistaken. Something that somebody like that. Gase, so, yeah, because Gase, somebody Gase, yeah, cause Gase drafted him and, and signed him. So he's familiar them, yeah. with him. So they want, obviously, somebody in their system, but obviously he's not the guy. And, no. And moving forward, they need somebody like Kaepernick or somebody else that can definitely take them to where they'd be more competitive. Because let's face it, this lineup as it stands right now is not going to get the job done. Not no. at all. No. no Le'Veon I mean, Bell can only do so much. Well, right. they're not even – to me, honestly, I don't think they're using him right. I think that you got to get him in space, you know, and not try to run him so much. I mean, when I watched the game on uh, Sunday night when uh, Donald got hurt, they were running him in between the tackles. you got to get this man space. Right. Swing passes. You know, put him out on in the slot and let him run some slants. You get just got to create avenues for him to be able to get the ball, and they just they're not creative like that See, with him. I think they might tr- be trying to use him right, but the issue of it is, is like we said, their quarterback isn't exactly striking fear with his arm. Right, the receiving core isn't striking fear with what's going behind him. So you got defenses stacking the box and playing run defense and going, all right, we're going to stack the box, and if you run it to Le'Veon, you're not getting anywhere. Well, and if we you complete a pass, all right, darn, you're going to give up. You know. Less than ten yards. He, I mean, uh, Luke Falk averaged four point five yards uh, per pass. But that's why the swing passes. So I mean, that's the same thing with the Giants and Saquon. You know, I mean, yet yeah, last year they used him in space. I mean, they ran him in routes where he was wide open, but it wasn't by Saquon. It, I mean, obviously his ability is uncanny, but it was right. also play design. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what they got to start doing with Le'Veon. You got to start putting him in a position to be successful instead of just first and ten with Luke Falk as your quarterback. You're right. in an eye set. Right. Where's it going? I mean, you got to do something because the proof is in the pudding, as they like to say. I mean, statistically, a third down, uh, the Jets were 0 for 12. Mm. Uh, 0 for 1 on fourth down. They ran 47 total plays for the entire game. Uh, total yards were 105, and their average yards per play was 2.2. I, I mean, obviously, that just kills you. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that just goes without saying. It's going to kill you no matter what. And for the Jets, they need answers. And I don't see them coming down the anytime soon no i mean this say uh joe namath and his prime ain't coming through those doors yeah exactly yeah i mean this is going to be a very very long Uh season for the rest of the year for them because with Donald not coming back until week seven week eight i mean if they're zero and six it's done it's over with yeah the season's a wrap then there's no way they're gonna rattle off nine ten in a row (laughs) ten in a row yeah imagine that that would be the biggest six oh there's a couple there's a couple of games and then i'm looking at their schedule they might be able to pull off a couple wins after jacksonville they got miami they've got the giants washington (laughs) oakland the who the giants that's not a win i'm not i'm just saying i'm just reading (laughs) i mean that's my lock already i'll tell you that i'm just going through the schedule i mean uh, the giants as they're looking right now we'll get into this later Uh, that's looking good for the giants i mean but they've got Washington. Washington, Oakland, Cincinnati, Miami, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. Well, Baltimore might drop seventy on them. Yeah, <laughs> at this at this rate, Baltimore could easily. I mean, that, do that would be playing Madden right there. But mm-hmm. for, yeah, for for the Jets, I mean, there's no way they're running the table. I'm sorry. No, I know we have Jets fans listening. It's not happening. Ten ten straight wins is not happening when you're zero and six. If, no. if, if, if that no. if that happens, that will be the biggest sports story of the year. You would literally, yeah. I mean, you could give the Patriots 0-6, and, and they still wouldn't go 10 straight wins. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it, I'm it, sorry. It, it's, mean, oh, yeah, it's, yeah. it's unthinkable, no matter how good the Patriots are. And we have to give some more credit to the Patriots. And I mean, Oh, this, they, are, they are on another level right now. They're on another level, but there was also the one factor that happened this week, and we're not going to bother covering it because I'm sick and tired of talking about Antonio Brown. And it's hard to keep track at this point. Yeah, because there's just so much nonsense going on and just – Pull, pull up your favorite sports website. I guarantee you there's an article. Yeah, there's just so much just bad karma going on with him and his whole situation, and it's getting worse. Look for the video. You'll see flying furniture. Yeah, there's just so much going on with him in that whole situation that obviously the Patriots released him, rightfully so, with everything, yeah. all the accusations happening, and obviously he is going through the process of the investigations of all that stuff, so we're not yep. even addressing that. But distractions don't happen in the Patriots locker room. No. Exactly. Period. No. They set a precedent. They literally, it's just, it's, they shut the doors. And the crazy part is it's coming out now that players had issues with the release of AB, and they still go out and smack the Jets. Mm-hmm. The, the one thing I'll say about this, and I know we don't want to get too much into this, is having been a Patriots fan for a number of years, you could tell I had a gut feeling being a Patriots fan that something was going to happen 
Friday before it all went down when Belichick had his usual Friday press conference and of course all the questions are about Antonio Brown and he walked out midway through. That yeah, yo, that was stereotypical Belichick deadpan like the you know the Ben Stein from the Dry Eyes. The interview, the interview before he had the CBS game where uh-huh. they were like Danny I mean, Jacobson, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, the eyes what was that the, he what, gave what, her. What, what was the fun? The, yeah, for those who didn't see the clip, Dana Jacobson <laughs> from CBS uh, asked Bel- Belichick before the game, "What was the final straw that led to you guys releasing Antonio Brown?" Like without missing a beat, he goes, "We're focused on the New York Jets today," and just stared. Yeah, just yeah. the angriest. But, but I mean, Belichick obviously does is no love lost for the media and but just I could tell something was going to happen on Friday when he walked out in the middle of a press conference. There's two people that I live for with press conferences. Him Popovich. and Popovich. Yeah. My two favorite interviews because I love the fact that they just don't care. No. They don't. Belichick is such a professional and like I said And she literally she goes, "Thank you, Bill." And he just I mean, she knew Nods he was going to. She knew what he was going to well, say, but she had to. Well, try. man, I mean, she had to dude, try. but that was real cold blood. I mean, yeah. he didn't even say, "Yeah, you're welcome." It was just a head nod and boop well, right to the locker room because he he knows with the situation going on with Antonio Brown and all the allegations, and there's more news coming about those. And yeah, like I said, we're not covering that. No, but with all those distractions, Belichick knows enough to get his team refocused on the game on Sunday. Yeah. He has this mysterious power to do it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, shout out to the defense who I did, even as a Patriots fan, I didn't realize this, outside the muff punt and then the pick six, they haven't given up an offensive touchdown since the AFC three, Championship game. Three points. Right. Yeah, three points all season they've given up. It is yeah. insane to see, and the Patriots are on a roll right now, and they're going to be having a collision course with – Coach's lock of this past week. Well, let's mm-hmm. go. The Buffalo Bills. Which yeah. I will not I'm not circling that wagon right now because they're not using Josh Brown, but I believe I think the spread was four and a half. Something so, like that. Yeah, I think so they covered. No, thankfully. It, was six. it no. was six. Yeah, it was six. So they didn't cover. They didn't but cover. I'll tell you what, the Bills definitely played a very great first half and looked very scary in the second half. Yeah. As Something the, changed as that game went along. As the Bills fan in the room. Who was watching the game with you, yeah. Yeah, well, Pad was next to me watching the game. Yeah, and, I, I Actually, and, this was the game that I watched, too. Yeah, they looked very comfortable coming out of halftime. Yeah. Too comfortable for my liking. They were jumping on Cincinnati early, putting a lot of pressure on Andy Dalton and company. I, he, he looked all uncomfortable the entire first half. Right. And then the second half, I don't know what it is when they came out of halftime, and this is the second week in a row they've done this. They started up slowly. Yeah. And when you start slipping that much coming out of the halftime, but great teams are going to kill you for this. Well, I mean, they're lucky that the Bengals are a good team and not a great team. Because mm-hmm. if yeah. this was the Patriots next week, they they're have, coming back to win the they game. They would have 21 dropped on them. I will go out on the limb and say it. I hate saying it as a Bills fan, but I'm going to be honest. They came out and they were so sluggish with the ball, and Josh Allen – Needs to protect the football that when he's inter- running. That, well, oh, well, and that, that interception. And that interception. Well, and, Bad. The, and the other thing I know we were talking about when we were watching the game on Sunday, the other thing he needs to do is he's very much in the same style of like an Aaron Rodgers or a Brett Favre where pocket collapses, receiver's not open, and he starts running around trying to make a play happen. You need to learn to just like, all right, I got nothing, nothing's developing, throw it away. And it's a rookie thing he's still learning. Well, that's yeah, that's going to come as, the, I mean, Aaron Rodgers didn't have that and Brett Favre didn't have that. Right away. I mean, the only guy that you've really seen that has the ability just to know what's around him and running is Mahomes. Yeah. yeah. But then that's just, I mean, there's a different talent. T- different talent. Yeah. Talent. I mean, that's a different story altogether. But for Allen, though, I mean, stat wise, was looking all right 23 for 36, 243, one touchdown, but one costly interception. Yeah. yeah. Because once the turnover started happening, Cincinnati took over. Yeah. They, and they gave, capitalized. They gave him life. On, they gave him life. And that whole second half, though, at least the one thing as a Bills fan, which I have to say, I like seeing out of my team, but I am scared at the same time, is they have found a way to come back a lot. Right. And obviously the big drive to ice the game helped. And Frank Gore, the ageless wonder, 76 yards and one touchdown. Who yeah. would have predicted he would have been the workhorse back? Yeah. He shows you know the fountain of youth can still show up every now and then. They look good. I mean, and especially the key interception at the end to ice the game because Cincinnati was driving on him. Like I, I thought McDermott made a couple of questionable calls, play calls during that game. Right. Yeah. And they're lucky they didn't get bit by him. I'll be very honest. But the Bengals, this would have been a much different game though with AJ Green. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. If AJ Green was there, I mean, their whole season would be different. Right. That's, but I'm just saying, this but, game in particular, had he had been able to come back for this week, 
they definitely would have been able to complete that final drive. But, it, you know, Dalton just doesn't have any weapons right now. Right. So Cincinnati, they have nothing going on really in the Bills. They got a lot of momentum as a big big win come from behind, especially when they're honoring, honoring Pancho Billa. Yeah. Wow, well, that was that was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. yeah that was, and especially like the videos coming out after the game was over and his son was leaving the stadium and everyone was just kind of cheering him on and, and yelling his name out. Yeah, real yeah. top shelf. Yeah. yeah, absolutely top shelf. So for the Bills, a huge win going into next week because they got the Patriots. Mm-hmm. This is going to be the true test. Yeah. And for Measuring me, stick. For me, I need to see a couple things out of Josh Allen. One, I need him to have composure when he's seeing a lot of defenses that he's not going to see the formations coming. Right. Because Belichick is scheming for him. Mm-hmm. And two, he needs to cut down on the turnovers because two turnovers is too, too many against the Patriots. Oh, any good team. Yeah. Right. But but against the Patriots, they need to play as close to perfect as possible to have a chance to win this. Oh, yeah. And the defense, cover the screen pass. (laughs) I'm saying it right now. I said this all last season when Gronk was there. Cover the screen pass in the first half. Cover Gronk in the second half. Double team him. Also, also the game. For having watched the game with you on Sunday, cover passes that aren't exactly short and aren't deep, like in the middle. Because that was the one thing I kept noticing when watching the game on Sunday was, okay, they're not throwing short routes. They're not throwing deep routes. They're throwing in the middle, and, and they're that. getting burned. Cover two, baby. Yeah, yeah. and you can't. you can't do that. There was there were several people watching the game who were making like kind of that same sort of uh, – uh, observation like they can't really cover the pass can they no i mean they they struggle i guess i mean they they do well covering the outside but over the middle they gap it yeah, yeah. well when you run that cover too i mean that's you got to find the soft spot in the zone that's obviously what they were doing yeah right? and they were taking full advantage of it. i mean dalton was not messing around with that and he was doing what he needed to do right yeah. and he almost let him to come back it was just a matter of we got a great interception from trevay's white what else could you ask for i mean for the bills like i said it was a great win especially on poncho billa day so going into next week, true test coming up. Mm-hmm. Gonna have a prediction at the end of the show for that. Okay, not Ooh. saying. I'm, Ooh, we'll we'll see about it. Ooh, but going into my lock, I jumped on that cowboy bandwagon and rode it against Miami. How about them cowboys? <laughs> yeah, I mean you have to. You can't not pick against Miami. I, it, it's favorable, but I I will even give you a bold prediction. When we get the locks and leaps concerning Miami too. Oh, okay. But, well, I'm, funny you should mention Miami and, and records and everything, uh, and especially you know the Bills are three and zero, and then uh, the Dolphins are zero and three. The la- I saw a stat the other day that the last time uh, the Bills were three and zero and the Dolphins were zero and three was 2011. I want to say it was, and they both finished the year. Uh, I want to say it was six and ten. Ten and six, one mm. of the, one of the two. I mean, Miami's a mess. Yeah, we, we can't. I know we said it enough last week, but they've, I mean, they've, my put, God. they've given up. What is it like, one hundred and forty-one points or something like that in three weeks? They've given up so much that honestly, the season is a wash right now. Mm. It's not. It was. A, it was a wash week one. No, I mean, it, it, it's it, bad. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say it was a wash week one. I mean, it, it's common in not just football but any sport that like your first game of the season. Things don't look well. I remember it happening with the Yankees a couple of times where you got a pitcher comes out and he just absolutely gets shelled the first game of the season. So while it's in a, you know it's a little eyebrow raising to get blown out fifty nine to ten, you go all right. Maybe it was just a bad game. Maybe there was just some bad you know voodoo you know mojo in the locker room. Something. Let's see what they do week two. And then they get held scoreless and lose forty three to nothing. I, no, yeah, it, you know the ship is sunk at this. Well, point. after week one, when everybody's asking to get traded, yeah. I mean, if you have your entire team calling their agent saying "Get me out of here," mm-hmm. that is not a good look. And that's what no. was reported after week one. Yeah. And for Miami to have this happen, I mean, they're not even looking like they're trying to rally and win games. No, no. They, I mean, they're dead in the water as soon as the kickoff happens. Oh, in my opinion, they're just mailing it in. Like, I understand the whole tank for Tua thing. Right. Yeah, but, but that's this not is even like, what this is. No, this is on a whole other yeah. level of just we've quit. And that's how it looks. I mean, somebody try proving me wrong otherwise. Right. You can't. You, you literally can't. What is tanking for Tua going to do when your team is this bad? No, you're going to have to rebuild everything. Everything. Because, because right now, there is no identity for the Dolphins. They just have players on the field, in my opinion. And, yeah, granted, I do like ragging on Miami as a Bills fan. But, no, this is just sad. Well, it's crazy to see a guy come out of the Bill Belichick system, as Flores did, and have such discontent in the locker room. I mean, normally when guys leave a coaching tree like that and a pedigree, they come into it and people are like, 
oh man, we got you know this guy's coming from right. Belichick. He like, was he was the de facto head defensive coordinator. Like he never had the job title, but yeah. he was essentially calling defensive plays. So we're going to you know th- th- that's what we're going to instill in this locker room. You know, and there's excitement. I mean, Matt Patricia in Detroit. You see that there. You know when uh, Charlie Weiss left and went to Notre Dame. You know yeah. you get that that aura. You know, and you get that feeling of oh, this is going to be successful because this is a Bill, Bill Belichick guy. And then all of a sudden they come in, and this happens, and you're like, what is going on? What's the disconnect here? I think it's just a, a situation where Flores just doesn't have the guys he needs in, in that locker room for his system. I mean, you look back at last year how the Lions did, and it wasn't anything stellar or anything to write home about. I think the only thing that anyone remembers about their season last year was beating the Patriots on, what was it, Sunday Night Football? But nobody was talking about quitting. Yeah, right, nobody was talking about quitting, but you flip it to to from last year to this year, and now they're sitting at 2-0-1, and, and, they just, and the Detroit Lions just beat the Philadelphia Eagles in Philly. Right. right. So I think it might be a case of, you know, and this have and you see this in other sports too, where got new coach comes in, not exactly a great first year because a lot of the players aren't what his system works for, and he sure. just, he just needs to get the guys in in there that work for his system. I just think unfortunately he's not going to have that opportunity. No, Flores, I don't think he is. Flores saying, deserves no. a chance. Oh yeah, but you can definitely tell the players are not buying into what he's and trying to that, instill. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. I don't think he's going to have year two. No, he, because he's not. G- given Miami's history with head coaches and how long they last, yeah, no, the trigger's going to get pulled well, quick on this. one. Unfortunately, if he does go zero and sixteen or one and fifteen, because yeah. that's how it's looking right now, yeah. right. If he goes that route, yeah, he's gone. I right? Mean, no, just, there's they, no way. There's no way. There's no way you can bring somebody right. back. Right. Like I that. mean, you bring up 0 and 16, 1 and 15. Looking at their schedule, they've got the uh, Los Angeles Chargers uh, this week. Then they've got a bye week, uh, and then their remaining opponents are the Washington Redskins, Buffalo Bills, That's a win loss, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, loss, New York Jets, mm. tie, <laughs> uh, Indianapolis Colts, <laughs> Buffalo loss. Bills, loss, Cleveland Browns, loss, Philadelphia Eagles, loss, Jets. Loss. Giants. Well, Darnold will be back. Loss. Oh, they, yeah. The Giants, that's a win. That's a loss. Uh, Bengals. Loss. And then in New England to close out the season. Uh, well, it depends on who's playing for New England at that point. Right. It's just going to be a wrap for Miami. I mean, that's just all you can say. Because, I mean, look at it in the games we covered. I mean, New England beat the Jets 30-14. to Yeah. The Bills won against Cincinnati 21-17. to So looking at your peers in the AFC East. Right. Yeah. Your loss 31-6 to against Dallas. Mm-hmm. You have the lowest common denominator on uh, looking around at your peers. Right. You just look like you shouldn't be playing football, and that's what it looks like right now. Because you flip it to Dallas and their stat line against you, I mean, Prescott, 246, two touchdowns, one interception. Ezekiel Elliott, 125 on the ground. Tony Pollard had 103 and a touchdown on the ground. Yeah, two running backs with 100-yard games. That's not a very often stat. (laughs) No, you don't see that happen that often, but honestly – Dallas shut them down in the second half. Yeah, and yeah. It was it was ugly. I mean, there's nothing to say about it. Miami. Whatever spark they had in that first quarter, gone. Yeah, and they never really recovered. And for Dallas, it's a it's a good win because you know what? As they're looking right now, three and zero. No, don't don't be that. Don't no take no that. no no no. Okay, okay. Easy, easy. I'm not All punching right. a Super Bowl ticket. Right, I was gonna I was like gonna jump down your throat if you were gonna say that because no. I these Cowboy fans right now I am. So tired of hearing this. Good that your team is three and zero, fantastic. But you have beaten a Danny Dimesless Giants, mm-hmm. a awful Miami team, and then Washington, and fill in the blank. Yeah, Washington. Yeah, right. Well, that's what Kudos. I'm saying. They took advantage of the games yeah. that they've had against them. That's where I was going. Very with fair. That. And that's a fair point. Yes, because obviously with the Giants, and we're going to get into that next. Danny segment. Dimesless Giants. Yes. Thank you. And going against Washington. Yeah. Oh God. It, which I mean, they're just another mess. I mean, you could, well, th- that Bears defense is something else. Yeah. That I mean, Bears defense is scary good. Oh, well, Khalil Mack is just on yeah. a whole other level. That whole front seven is on a whole other level. Yeah. Casey like, Keenum. Khalil, Khalil Mack has got to be haunting like the entire Gruden family nightmares. Oh, oh. Ka- Casey Keenum right now must be like he must have had the worst night of sleep ever. Yeah. Because yeah. he was just getting hit. I and now I know and I know fans during the game last night were saying, "Let's go, uh, Haskins." Oh. Now I did. I forget. Who, <laughs> I forget who said it on Twitter. It was somebody from ESPN, but I got to give him kudos because this was a really good take. Don't I realize they realized that this was a poor situation and an awful game. Don't do that to Haskins. Oh, for and, sure. And put him in the game and just absolutely crush the kid. I yeah. thought the give same him, thing. Give him, give him a week to prep, and if you want to put him in this week, sure. Okay. Well, I saw. I, I thought the same thing with the Giants last week, but Buffalo when Eli had three passing yards that entire first half, I was like, "You got to put you got to put Danny in the yeah. second half." 
But then I thought to myself, God, Buffalo's defense is absolutely killing the Giants yeah. right now. That's no favor to the kid. And that would have been the same thing. This is a yeah. complete tangent. We were talking about the Cowboys, but I just I had to give credit to Chicago's defense. Right, and you bring up kind of and getting back to the Cowboys. I know you mentioned, you know, they face Miami. Let's, let's be honest. They're a JV team. Yeah. Like, no disrespect. They're awful. Uh, looking at the Dallas Cowboys' next couple of opponents, they travel to New Orleans uh, this coming week uh, on Sunday Night Football. Uh, week 5, they play the Green Bay Packers at home. Week 6, they travel up to New York and play the Jets. And then Week 7, they uh, stay at home and play the Philadelphia Eagles before they have their bye week in Week 8. Yeah, so the true tests are coming. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, the, that, so that's what I'm saying. Dallas is doing what a good team does. Right. You take well, what, advantage of a lesser team. And what a team has to do when you look at the second half, like the next right. half of your schedule. Right. right. And after the bye week, they got some interesting games. They got the Giants, Vikings, Lions, Patriots, Bills, and Bears. So, I mean, winnable games, yeah. but also some losses. Yeah. Right. This is going to show you what you really have out of your team. And especially mm-hmm. for the two guys that are asking for contracts. Well, one did get paid. The other one is now asking for more money. With Prescott and Elliott, this is the time you prove your contracts. Well, yeah. respectively. I mean, Prescott already yeah. said that he's all right playing this year out with what he's got and going sure. into next year with negotiations. But he's looking very good. He's, yeah. look, he's looking very good. He's making and a statement for a good contract. Yeah, every, every game that he's had, he's played well, and it's definitely to the point where it's like maybe what he's asking for wasn't completely nuts. I mean, being yeah. paid the top quarterback in the league is yeah. asinine, but being a top 10 paid quarterback – Probably yeah, making sense if he can carry them to the NFC East title and a run. Oh, if if he can, sure. Then then you cut that check. I would say if he can, and it, I'll throw in the caveat: if he's in consideration for maybe talks of MVP, he can be in talks, but unless it's Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes, that's right. yeah, that's no, not. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. mean, as as in the NFC East guy in the room, I would definitely say that. He's looked a lot better than what we had when I was talking about him in the preview show. Sure. What he could be because sure. he's definitely carried his load and his end of the deal. Yeah. Now that was against again three really bad teams that he's looked really good. Let's see him when he has to play the Patriots mm-hmm. and that defense. Yeah. Let's see him play that Bears defense and even a very improved Green Bay defense. Right. I mean, their last three games of the season are against the Rams, the Eagles, and then I want to say the Redskins. I mean, the Rams defense isn't great, but it's good. Yeah. You know, I mean, they yeah. haven't played up to where they were last year, but no. they're playing well still. No. no. No, definitely not. And speaking of teams that did not play up to where they should be. Oh, well, they started dun, off dun, slow. Dun. Atlanta. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, well, that was a slow start. Our, for our leap of leaps. Yeah. Around our, the around Our the huge one and a half point leap. Yeah, I mean, it was a close game. Uh, final score ended up being the Indianapolis Colts defeating the Atlanta Falcons by a final score of 27-24. 29 of 34 for 304 yards, three touchdowns, one interception from Matt Ryan. Jacoby Brissett, 28 of 37 for 310 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. Yeah, but it was not that close in the first half. <laughs> right, no, I mean, it's like I said, you look at the box score, and it, it was a slow start. I mean, Atlanta, no points in the first, three in the second, uh, seven in the third, and then 14 in the fourth. Who is Atlanta? What what is Atlanta? Yeah, we What ever, what is this team? They have no identity. You keep we keep going back. Oh, it's the you know, the Super Bowl really messed with their minds, but Steve Sarkeesian's out as the offensive yeah, coordinator. I mean, we're how many years removed? We're how many years removed from all that stuff? Uh, you can't use it as an excuse. They still have the best wide receiver in the game in yeah. Julio Jones. Yeah. You still have a very capable quarterback in Matt Ryan. Yeah, I mean the, the run game is you know, good. Yeah. Freeman's good, not great. Yeah, six, Freeman's six, a solid running back. Sixteen carries, eighty-eight yards, no touchdowns. And and you and you got Sanu, you got Ridley, Hooper, who they don't even use. I don't understand. I mean, six catches, sixty-six yards, two touchdowns. Yeah. Oh, all right. So they used him this game, oh, but, but I mean, other games he's been right. not. Other games he disappears. Right. I mean, but yeah, it's kind of like you said. It's a question of what do you got to do? Because like I said, three hundred and four yards from Matt Ryan, eighty-eight yards from Devontae Freeman, one hundred and twenty-eight yards from Julio Jones, seventy-five yards from Mohamed Sanu. Like, what's the disconnect here? They just can't get it together. I don't know what it is, but with all that offensive talent they have, and granted, they they have one superstar in Julio Jones. Yeah. Everybody else are is a good player, is a great player. Yeah, I'll, I'll even give, I'll say great. I mean, I would put Matt Ryan at one of the a great player category. Yeah, yeah I would yeah. definitely. I mean, too. but for some reason they can't get it together. No, they can't. And at all. I and I can't figure it out for the life of me. This team should be running away yeah. with that NFC South, especially with a Drew Breesless 
Saints oh, come and on. Cam I mean, Newton for less sure. Panthers. Yeah. Well, can't we don't even I don't get Cam Newton at all. So. Yeah, so I'm just saying, but he's out in there with saying Listain fracture now. List Frank, what, List yeah, Frank injury. Or he's out. They've already ruled him out for next week. Right. So this should be Atlanta's division to win yeah. outright with everybody healthy on paper. Yep. But yet you go to Indy, you get punched in the mouth in the first half down what, twenty to three? Yeah. By a Jacoby Brissett led team. Right, and a Jacoby Brissett who it got this got lost in all the shuffle yesterday. Jacoby Brissett hit his first team throws in the to start the game. He went sixteen for sixteen to start the game. Yeah. And Atlanta has defensive players. Yeah. yeah. They have players on both sides of that ball. <laughs> yeah. So how are you not running away with games? Yeah. And this and, was this was a game they should have won. And it's not even like you're going up north to play in an open field environment. You're, you're a dome. going in a dome. Yeah. You're a dome team playing in a dome. This makes no sense to me on paper. None. Just doing the eye test. I don't know what it is. It, if they just don't want to play for Matt Ryan anymore or he is just overwhelmed with what he's got to do down there? I don't know, because it just looks like on that offensive side of the ball, they just don't have any rhythm. They don't have any sense of what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, I would say offensively, it's a huge question mark. I mean, you you, you have the capabilities of being a, a pass-first team with Julio Jones. I mean, the guy is open even when he's covered. Yeah. yeah. So it's not like you need to say, hey, you know, we need to establish the run and then work our way to the pass with play action. You can get him open regardless. So when he has 126 yards and a touchdown, how are you not winning games? It makes no sense. It absolutely makes no sense. And for Atlanta, you have the window to get back into the playoffs. Yeah. But if you play another game like that against Indy with another team, that window is going to slam shut. And at the moment, it's a window the size of a freaking semi-truck. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Hey, I mean, New Orleans just won that game, though, in Seattle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bridgewater looked good. He, I mean, he was capable. Yeah, he looked good. But, I mean, like I say, I'm, I don't think they're losing sleep at night game planning against him by any stretch of the means. Not at all. So that's what I'm saying. With Atlanta, you have all those weapons on both sides of the ball, yet you can't put it together. And every week I'm wondering wow. what team is going to show up. They honestly remind me of the L.A. Chargers. Okay. You okay. have talent on both sides of the ball. You should be dropping forty on teams. That's yeah. a, that's Easy. actually a really fair statement because they have been the Chargers have been a question mark. Oh yeah, the whole. I mean, everybody thought they were going to run away with that division and they're going to limit Yours to that truly. division win. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. I've said the same thing for sure. Oh yeah, no, but I'll, I mean, I'll own that statement. But they, it's exactly the same side of the ball. They're the same side of the coin between those two. Atlanta and the Chargers are the same team. You have all those weapons, yet you can't put it together for whatever reason. So now every Sunday, it's Who's going to show up? Will that real team show up? And it's it's sad that it, it always is. Is it the Super Bowl? Like you can't even talk about that anymore. No, right. it's not an excuse because at this point, if you're really if you have that big of like a it, it was it was three Super Bowls ago now. Yeah, I mean if, if you're you having that, that much of a, of a hangover, yeah, the time to retire. Exactly, you got to implode that team. Yeah, and I I hate saying it, but you have all those weapons on both sides of the ball, and you can't get it together, and you're losing the games you should win. If you want to be a serious contender, you need to rebuild and start over. Because that, I mean, that's that's a game that you have to win. Yeah. Period. That is, a, yeah. There's no excuse for that. You can't you can't go in when you have the rest of your division pretty much limping right now. You know, Tampa Bay obviously it, not very good. They're not good, and they're young, and there's still a lot of question marks. Yeah, and them. they got a first first year head coach there running his new system. Then you got obviously Carolina without their starting quarterback. You know, I mean, and New Orleans is is limping too. So it's like now is the time to capitalize, and then you go into mm-hmm. a game in a dome mm-hmm. and you put up a dud. Yeah, no excuse, none. So they need to do some work moving forward. Otherwise, that window is slamming shut. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if I know uh, New Orleans' schedule is going to get a little, you know, stressful towards this part of the season here. Yeah. But I mean, Atlanta's got to win some games. Yeah. They got to win some games and they got to win them in a hurry. That's all there is to it. But let us know what you think. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. What was your locks and leaps this past week? What do you think about all the teams that won and lost? What's your take on Atlanta? We want to know. Hit us up on that hashtag. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Brian Wolf from Fair City Fire. You are listening to ODPH, the greatest podcast in Binghamton. Woo! Hot lips touching, cool thighs, feel the shot running up. 
Coming back for the second segment on this edition of the ODPH, and we have to go into our game of the week. Mm-hmm. This one had a lot of social media buzz yeah. on our social media accounts, so if you're not following, make sure to check them out at ochoduroparleyhour.com. But the game of the week was the New York Giants taking on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Pat, yeah. you got that stat line? Yeah, uh, New York Giants won by a final score of 32-31. to 31. Daniel Jones, the Messiah. Uh, For he has arrived. Uh, 23 of 36 for 336 yards passing, two touchdowns, no interceptions. On the flip side, Jameis Winston, 23 of 37, 380 yards, three touchdowns, one interception. Coach, we are turning the microphone over to you because I know our listeners from Andy Adams to <laughs> all our other Giants fans are eagerly anticipating this take. So well, first, let's talk about Saquon being down because that's Ouch. scary. Four to eight weeks with a high ankle sprain. Right. They're going to hold him out till well after the bye week probably, yeah. which is at week 11. Yeah. So that's a long time for no Saquon Barkley. And I'm either. looking at the stat, the box score here. Uh, you need somebody because their leading rusher on uh, Sunday after Saquon went out was Daniel Jones. Four carries for 28 yards. After that, it was Sterling Shepard, who I believe is a receiver. Well, you ain't running on that front seven. Yeah. That Tampa Bay defense, that front seven is very, very good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, let's get to ta- let's yeah, get to yeah, Danny Jones. I'm though. turning it over to you. Yeah, Listen, you get- I mean, he played a great game. I As much flack as I gave him, as much flack as I've given – I'm, you know, Ken, pass the ketchup. I got to eat some crow here. Okay. He played a great game. He he played great. He looked great, comfortable in the pocket. You know, obviously there's some finite things, you know, protecting the football being one, you know, still almost gave up another fumble, or he did give up a fumble, uh, you know, with the pass rush. The offensive line played terrible. Sacked five times. Nate Soldier gave up four of those. Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, Nate Soler used to be a doing and Patriot. Bad. If there's one thing, he's going to give up a sack. He's also good for at least one uh, flag a game. Well, I mean, my God, when you pay a man the way that they're paying him and he gives up four sacks, yeah. that's terrible. Yeah. He made Shaq Barrett look like a pro bowler. Uh, obviously, the touchdown pass to Evan Ingram, 75 yards, fantastic. The touchdown pass to Sterling Shepard in the corner of the end zone. Look, look at that play because that ball is a dime. Uh, no pun intended there. Listen, they obviously needed to make the change. The team wasn't playing very well. Yeah. Pat Schumer was able to op- open the offense up for the first time. You could tell that he was much more comfortable in his play calling ability because he had a dual threat at quarterback. So they were able to even run, you know, a couple RPOs, you know, run pass option plays. They even ran a read option, which was Danny uh, uh, Danny Dimes. I'm sorry, his first touchdown. Um, and that was a great look. It was a great play. Now let's not uh, let's not forget though. They won this game because Tampa Bay's field goal kicker missed a kick. Mm-hmm. Let us not forget. Before you start praising his name, Tampa the Giants did not win. Tampa Bay lost. I'll say Tampa Bay's got a thing for having issues with kickers. They do. He was it's a Grammatica curse. Here's yeah, the craziest well, thing. Could be. They were four. He was four for four. Now the Giants did. They miss, he missed an extra point, and the Giants blocked one. All right, mm-hmm. it's, but, well, I'll just say this though. Slight side note: It's something with the kickers this year because Vinatieri missed like four kicks in and the first retired. <laughs> missed like four, like four kicks and in, in something like that, and, and, re- and retired. He had to get talked out of it. Yeah, I mean, and then uh, Stephen Goskowski, who's normally money, has tied his career high in misses in points and PATs in like three weeks. Yeah, even Rosa missed the extra yeah, point uh, kick, which is crazy. With, some with kickers this year. Yeah, it's, I, it's something odd with kickers, but for Daniel Jones, I mean, look, he had a great game. Yeah. And you have to take that in very good positivity if you're a Giants fan. Hey, I loved everything I saw from the kid, minus the, the you know pocket awareness with protecting the ball. My biggest takeaway is, and with all of these Giant fans who were – you know, poo-pooing Eli and, oh, you know, and and building Daniel Jones up like he was, the like I said before, the equivalent of Roman Reigns, mm. and you got to book him strong and you got to book him big. The, they didn't have any film on him, so Tampa right. Bay had no idea exactly. what to look for. Right. They didn't know that they were gonna the Giants were going to break out RPOs. Eli Manning has been the quarterback for 16 years and never ran one read right, option. Right. I mean, it's a, it's like I in, mean, yeah, it's like in baseball when you get a uh, batter, a good player called up and they start hitting monster home runs. They just, they just go on a streak and just hit a ton of home runs. It's because they don't have any tape on the guy. As soon as they start getting enough tape on the guy, that's when you start seeing, all right, how good are they really? And that's exactly what's going to come down the pipe here because now yeah. they know, okay, there's no Saquon. Mm-hmm. No. There's 
you know, obviously the wide receivers are going to come back here. Sterling Shepard looked healthy, and, which was fantastic. Golden Tate's going to be back here in another week. So they're going to have weapons there. But without Saquon, you know, it's going to be very one-dimensional. I mean, Wayne Gilman is a comparable back, but he is not a 20-plus carry a game back. By no means. So, I mean, where they go from here now that they've got tape on them, you know, luckily they've got a Redskin team that's up against the ropes at home mm -hmm. with Danny Jones' first, you know, home game. Yeah. So that's going to be beneficial for them schedule-wise. But then they play a Minnesota team that's always given the Giants a hard time, yeah. especially given Eli a hard time because yeah. of what they do defensively. So, you know, that will be a very interesting and very telling game for what he's going to be in the future. I mean, you have one great performance, but let's not anoint this guy king yet. Yeah, yeah, because and I, that's what the giant. That's what these fans are doing. Like, I get it. I want the. I want this kid to succeed, but you have to have a sense of like, of common sense here. Yeah. Like, there has to be some sort of like rational thinking. Yeah. of he's a rookie. There's no tape. Tampa Bay has got a good defense. They still could have went down and won the game. Right. I mean, there's been plenty of flashes in the pans in other sports where they have a real great first game or a real great first half of the year, whatever you want to call it, and then they, whatever reason, they just fall off. Is it a promising? I'll, you know, because this was something I know the Michael K. Show brought up and when they were on the air uh, yesterday down in New York. You know, you fill in the blank. You know, Daniel Jones' first start was blank, and I would say promising. Yeah. Optimistic. Hopeful. Like, it, it's a good, Hopeful. It's, yeah. a, it's a good look, but, you know, the old saying, don't count your chickens before they hatch. Yeah, it was a great game, but you got a rough stretch coming up after the bye week. Chicago, Green Bay, Philly. Back to back to back. Like, you know, it's not going to be easy. So is it promising? Yes. Is it optimistic? Yes. But like Coach said, don't anoint the kid the next coming of, you know, of Jesus or whatever you want to call it and, and, and to heap his praises. Like, yeah, he's looking good, but let's get tape on the kid. He's yeah. looking good. Yeah. And if you're a Giants fan, like I said, you have to take this game with a lot of positive notes from it. Yeah. You do. He looked the part. He definitely got the team motivated behind him. Obviously, with Saquon Barkley going down, the road was not going to be easy to get a W. Yeah, and, and he definitely gave a spark to that that team because I read a story online. I think it was either during the game or after the game that there was one point in the game where you know things were kind of looking you know, ho hum, whatever. And Daniel Jones, uh, I guess, yelled at the team, "Let's bleep and go!" Yeah. And there were several players that did a double take because they've never heard him swear and they've never seen that kind of fire. Oh, he walked into the huddle right before the game winning drive and said, "Let's go win this effing game." Oh God. Oh well. The thing now is, congratulations, Amazing. kid. You're yeah, the, you're the king of New York for a week. Congrats. You won one game at Tampa Bay on the road. Yeah. Fantastic. Who you got again next week? Washington. 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 So guess what? You had better wipe the floor with them. At home. At home. A divisional game. Because if you put up another close game and it comes down to a kick and let's say it doesn't go in the favor of the Giants... Good luck with that New York media. Oh, man, they still would have ate that game, Ken. They're, he could have gone into that game, and they Tampa Bay could have gone down and won and kicked that field goal and made it. The story still would have been Danny Jones in New York. Oh, so oh. It'll, it'll be interesting to see how he does, though, because I pulled up the stats. Washington as a team is giving up an average of 402.7 yards per game on defense. Yeah, I mean, that's a very, very good stretch of games yeah. Tampa Bay on the road Washington at home that's a very like favorable thing for him right. let's see him go up against that Chicago defense yeah yeah because that defense is I mean we talked about it just the last segment scary yeah yeah we have to face the Chicago's and the Philadelphia's yeah and the Patriots are coming down the pike too mm -hmm. yeah and so, I mean with no so without your your primary weapon in Saquon Barkley now it's all on him right now yeah yeah so, so that injury could not have been at the worst time and I mean I don't want to sound like a negative Nancy, but I mean, I just the fact that you these people are so unappreciated of the things that Eli Manning did. It is ungodly. This man, it is egregious. I, it's 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 atrocious. You I people. mean, you you people. Yeah, I'm gonna say you people. You sit here and you naysay this man that won two Super Bowls. I, listen, I grew up as a true Giants fan, meaning that we were gonna suck my entire lifetime. I was raised on the fact that the Giants were never going to do anything. They're always going to disappoint you, Sean. That's what I was always told. They're always going to be bad. We dealt with the David Browns. We dealt with the Kent Grahams. We dealt with Danny Cannell. I mean, quarterback after quarterback after quarterback of just awful, awful right. quarterbacks. Yeah. And then Eli comes in and he beats an undefeated Patriot team. Then a few years later beats a Patriot team that you know had a couple losses, but I mean, looked probably the best Patriot team 
better than that undefeated team. Yeah, you could Because defensively, that. they were very, very good that yeah. year. Mm. And he beat that team. And these people just, oh, it's all Eli's fault. He's the reason why we're 0-2. And he's the reason why we lost last year. And he's the reason why we lost at Green Bay. And this, that, and the third. This guy won you two Super Bowls in your lifetime that you never were going to have before. And, and there's teams, Ken, that have not won a Super Bowl your entire life. Mm-hmm. And they went to four. Mm-hmm. This guy is 2-0 and in the Super Bowl and beaten two of the best teams in football history. Yeah, Give him some credit. He should have credit. The, the fans that you're referring to are the ones that don't understand the game, in my yeah. opinion. I mean, Completely. Because it's, it's, it's always nice when you it's fun to jump on the bandwagon and start being angry and blaming somebody just to get jo- join the crowd. Right, for yeah. some yeah, reason. And, and, it's, it's, the, it's the culture we live in, and, and it's stupid. His problem is is his last name. Yeah. Because if, yeah. if it was Eli uh, Smith. Smith, yeah, Smith or, or Matthews, there would have been no problem. He would have been the greatest quarterback in Giants history. But he's got Manning on the back of that jersey. Yeah, no, I think you have a point there. I think the name definitely plays a part in it, given his brother's success and you know all the stats and all the records. His and brother, all his the records. Had. But it's like you said, if this were any other quarterback or he had any other last name, it would have been a you know it sucks he did it, he gave us a lot of great years but you know it's just time you know yeah. but but I think like you said because it's Manning and 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 the stature and and the gravitas that comes with having the last name of Manning it, it's what comes with it and and that's why people are harping on him and he's being such a team player right now yeah he's I mean doing he the was right the thing. first guy that after Dane Jones scored that touchdown that he came and congratulated so he's still in the locker room being a positive presence when yeah. honestly. Look at the discontent the discontent that Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers had after yeah. Aaron Rodgers was drafted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Brett I mean shunned him in the locker room. Yeah. And instead, Eli, you know, being his team and being the captain and everything has embraced the fact that, you know, he knew that Father Time was coming and he knew that this guy was drafted for a reason and embraced his role as a mentor. He's definitely handled it a lot better than other quarterbacks in recent history. And yeah, and I just I just wish that people would not just bash on this man when he's done so much and i mean not the not even just that the fact that i mean he's the walter payton award winner two years in a row i mean that so what he was doing outside of the football field and in the city of new york is tremendous so let's just great that dane jones has a first game but let's not forget the things that eli did but let's yeah. but we can move on sure. i'm okay moving on i'm all right i'm i'm here i'm on the danny dimes bandwagon baby sure i i'm not Leading the ship, but I'm in the back. I'm no, hanging out. But the thing that we have to take away, just to kind of wrap this up, though, with Eli, if you are a true Giants fan, you have to appreciate everything he's done. You can't jump into the bandwagon of, oh, you haven't done anything lately and you're responsible for us losing. No. He won you two chips you shouldn't have won. Let's and two Super honest. Bowls MVPs. That's what I'm saying with that. <laughs> he showed up when he needed to, and that was the postseason. He's so. the reason i got to turn the channel whenever two certain plays come on my television. <laughs> right. So you have to give him his respect there. And And, like I said, for what he's done for the Giants, I mean, obviously when he was drafted, I know there was a little controversy because he didn't want to go play in San Diego. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, do you blame him? (laughs) Well, I'm just kidding. I I mean, San Diego's a lovely place. Lovely weather. I, I, I would play for the Chargers, that's me. But besides the point, he came, he did what he needed to do in New York, he won, and he went down as a legend for New York. If you're a fan that is bashing him, you don't really understand the game, and you're no. coming off like a fair weather fan. And yeah, exactly. And I listen. And, and it, I have no time for those. Danny Jones has one game under his belt, mm-hmm. and it was a great game. Mm-hmm. Let's see a body of work. I want to see the body of work, and then if he has a bad stretch of games, not wishing it on him. I don't want to see any fan that was jumping on the bandwagon, buying the jersey, saying "Let's go, <laughs> let's t-shirts, go," getting the t-shirts, Danny and all Dimes, that, and, hashtagging and it. doing that foolish burn in it. Because he had a bad three stretch run and sure. then jumping off and saying we need Eli back, I, you don't have the right. I'm revoking your fan card right now. I want to see him with a body of work. I also want to see how he handles adversity. Get a game against you know, da- let's just say Dallas. Yeah. Because, because we know how the game went it went against Dallas week one. You know, let's see how he does against maybe a team like Dallas where he's got a piss poor passing game. You know, barely any completions and like three interceptions. I want to see how he bounces back from that and handles adversity. If, from that because that tells me more about a player than any stat on the field can. Well, let's just talk about Washington next week has Landon Collins coming back to New York after all the discontention that he had with Gettleman. I'm sure mm-hmm. the crowd I will mean, welcome him with lovely and open arms. Well, I mean, it, 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 listen, I'm as a Giants fan, I didn't want 
Collins gone, but Collins left because Gettleman didn't want him. So, right. I mean, at the end of the day, you got this guy coming back into Giants Stadium. You got D'Angelo Hall there, too. So they, it's not that they have a bad secondary. It's just that they've played some really good teams. So let's see how he does against this defense and the and Landon Collins leading the charge against them. Yeah. That's what we have to see this week. Is he going to be Danny Dimes again or is he going to be Danny Duds? We need to figure this out. Coin that one, Ken, quick. Hashtag Trademark. That. Join in the conversation on social media. Coach Duffy is there waiting for any and all Giants hey, fans to jump in. You fair weather people at me. I'll, I'll discuss Eli facts with you all day. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, right. I, will, I will take your hate, and I will thrive on it. Exactly. Because, like I say, if you're blaming Eli for any of this nonsense, you're not really watching the game. And I'll stand by that statement with Coach. But definitely interact on social media. Hit us up on that hashtag. Hashtag ODPH. OchoDuroParleyHour.com for more information. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. It's a hard Hey, this is Vince, the Cowan Man, a local MMA fighter, telling you to keep on listening to the ODPH, the 607's up-and-coming newest podcast. Coming back for segment number three on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Time to run the ropes, give mm-hmm. you our pro wrestling recap here on the show. A lot of moves happening for the WWE this week, yeah. and none bigger than their debut of NXT on USA Network. Hot debut. So let me ask this around the panel. What was your overall thoughts, starting with Coach? I mean, I definitely, you Undisputed Era is definitely going to have a heavy influence Gold. moving forward, which is probably the best thing to do. I mean... Obviously, heel champions and faces chasing them are always kind of the way that WWE is always booked. Yeah. And that's clear that that's the direction that NXT is going to take. And I think it's kind of a, 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 an ironic thing because that's their equivalent of the elite, I yeah. would say. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, Cole being you know a former Bullet Club and elite guy or Mount Rushmore guy. Then you talk about, you know... Uh, um, Roddy Strong. Roddy and, Strong. Well, I was thinking more of um, Fish and O'Reilly. Fish and O'Reilly, you know, being the, uh, you know, more of an elite tag team, but more of a purist tag team, yeah. you know, not so much of a of a spot fest, you know, type thing as the Young Bucks are. So almost like the anti Young Bucks. So it's like, you know, you can definitely feel that that's kind of the vibe that they did. And I love it. And I mean, not to mention then all the UK influence that came over. Yeah. I mean, Pete Dunn is money. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely money. He he plays the part. He looks the part. He is the part. I, I To me, having him on NXT is probably the best thing because he's going to get booked favorably. But, I mean, honestly, he could be on the main roster and win a championship belt, and I, it would be believable to me. I think they may have, if they end up doing another War Games, and I'm not sure if they are or not, if they are, cool. Uh, I think they may have surreptitiously, subtly hinted at their war games match in this first thing. I, you know, because with the uh, them bringing in Imperium yes. from NXT UK, right? Love this. Get get you doing a war games matchup between Undisputed Era and Imperium? Yes, please. I mean, I'm all for any, all of them, any and all. Yeah, yeah. you you give me Walter versus Kushida, I oh, am there Lord all Emerson. day. Well, I just think it's so funny because Omega's had that, you know, that statement about NXT being, you know, a, a minor league division there mm-hmm. yeah. because it was a quote unquote developmental territory. But I mean, when you look at the talent and the who's who is on there, yeah. I mean, let's face it: does Adam Cole really need to be on the NXT roster? No, of course no. Not. You know, I mean, does you know Roderick Strong need to be there? No, I mean, so it's like, yeah, okay, they were NXT, but it was almost because of spoil of riches and not so much because they yeah. needed to be there because they needed to develop. Yeah. All I can really take away from this episode is I thought it was very good. I did hate the lag issues switching over from USA to the network. Well, that was a widespread right, thing, too. That wasn't just us. I missed most of the Pete Dunn match, so yeah. I had yeah. to recap that. Yeah, if, yeah, WWE's definitely got to fix that if... if they're going to make that the thing this coming week because this it, is supposed it, to be the last week of it. Right. And if you didn't have issues of uh, many a people uh, when switching over from USA network to the WWE network, were having login issues to where they couldn't even watch the match. Yeah. So they need to fix that moving forward. And obviously with what they're setting up now with Imperium now over, if this is going to be a permanent thing or whatever the case is, it can only really help that brand because mm-hmm. the fact that they're making the transition next week to what the two hour show on USA, yeah. right? Yeah. 
they need to really have a star-studded show to compete with AEW's yeah. Wednesday Night Dynamite or whatever it's called. Well, just you need to have depth. You yeah, have, yeah. got to have bodies to fill two hours, yeah. you know? And that's why I think you're going to start seeing some WWE guys sure. from the main roster sure. come back to NXT sure. to fill that out. Sure. I th- the one quick thing that stood out to me, uh, shout out to Cameron Grimes for one of the nastiest pinfalls I've ever seen in the 10-second oh. win against uh, Sean Maluda. Oh, my God. Blink and you miss it. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he is going to get pushed through the moon on NXT. Grimes? Well, it's just, I mean, what are they going to do with the draft? You know, I mean, that's going to be the interesting thing. It's yeah. going gonna to be the biggest X factor, and I think that that's why I'm going to kind of use this to segue into the Monday Night Raw sure. recap that we were talking about off air. You're going to start seeing all brands involved with this: mm-hmm. it's Raw, SmackDown, NXT, and 205 Live. Which, if we, if I believe, is being blended in with NXT now. Yeah, and I think that's a great move. Yeah, oh yeah. I, I think it's a perfect crowd for it. It's a perfect crowd for it. The talented roster that they have in the cruiserweight division will really shine there. Well, and it makes sense to have the cruiserweights going up against the AEW matches because the cruiserweights right. are going to move. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that one star that is standing out right now from his push is Chad Gable. Mm-hmm. Right. And I know we didn't recap this on the show last week, but Baron Corbin did become king of the ring. Shocker. Yeah. Which was a very big surprise, I will say, when oh, we I first saw the sarcastic. T- no, I, I thought it was. I because I honestly thought it was gonna be Samoa Joe. Well, yeah. Once we first when the, when the but when he was in the finals, there was oh, it was a no, rap. there was, was no, a rap. yeah. And but it's only done great things for him because his heel character has really won me over, especially the dud feud with Seth Rollins and Lacey Evans and Becky yeah. Lynch. Yeah, with Lynch there, it just really w- just watered him down, like yeah. just the whole feud. So now he's coming back into his own. And he's really embracing the heel role. This is where I think he's going to really step up and shine. And for Gable, he's getting a chance to showcase his in-ring work. Mm-hmm. And we've always known from NXT, he can go. Oh, for yeah. sure. They, oh, yeah. I mean, he easily could be carrying that 8 to 9 o'clock transition sure. every night. He should be in that spot. Yeah, so this makes perfect sense. And this is the one real bright spot from Raw this week that stood out because we did have great wrestling matches on there. Oh, yeah. I mean, Nikki Cross and Sasha Banks was a great match, too. You know, Raw was actually booked well. Yeah. Yeah. Except for the ending. Yeah. Yeah. Because what they're doing with Bray Wyatt, I... They're running it into the ground. No, well, they're really trying to push him through the moon, obviously with a title shot coming at Hell in a Cell. Right. Which, hey, I'm all for but they're doing it so much that I don't know if it's really working, so to speak, of getting him over for what they're wanting to do because the character is great. Yeah, yeah. Bray's promos are great. Yeah. But him burying one of the top talents on the roster now with Braun Strowman, especially after Braun took that loss. I which said coach, it last week. Which, which coach said L's on L's on L's. I think uh, hurt, I think hurts him long term. See, for me, as as much as I like the Bray Wyatt's new character and and as cool as it is and as funny as Yowie Wowie and all that stuff is, for me, it's already getting run into the ground because before, okay, yeah, it, they dragged it on a little too long with the the lack of activity. I'll grant you that. But now you're getting to the point where he's opening the show and and you're having the kind of cut in footage or whatever you want to call it signal with the opener. And then he was in all. If I'm not mistaken, he was in all three segments or all three hours last night. And and if, if you're going to start doing that on a weekly basis, you're going to run it into the ground faster than you can blink. It's going to be a territory they really need to watch for because you, you, you have to find a balance to it. Because yes, you need to put him on there, and yes, you should feature him on there. The crowd loves it. The, every time they go to they go to commercial and they show that, oh hey, another episode of. Firefly Funhouse is coming on. You can hear the crowd pop every time, so you need to have him on there. But that's why all the, three segments, maybe not. That's why the minor characters kind of work, though. Yeah, using the puppets. I mean, utilize those things. They. I mean, that's what. Yeah. He, he doesn't need to be in the segments. The puppets just raise enough questions that people are like, "Oh, was that the bunny? Oh, whoa, 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 I mean, whoa yeah. What's he doing there? What, Craig, what's Craig, that? I mean, you have a wrestler walking through the backstage, and one of the puppets pops up, and almost immediately the pictures are all over Twitter. Yeah, and that 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 alone makes people pop. So it's like, why not utilize those figures as a way to maybe not put? Because I feel the same way, and I, I said, you know, we've talked about this before. I I feel the character. It's just a weird thing between the the segments on the Firefly Funhouse stuff and then the Fiend. Yeah, I just I don't I don't feel like there's the, I know there's the connection, mm. but for me I just don't see it. Like I don't. It's just a really weird thing that you know the it's the Firefly Funhouse 
and then there's the fiend. Right. I mean, I like it, and I I still do. And I I, 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 I like, like when it. he started it, and and he he was attacking you know legends and all that. I I had the idea, and I thought, oh, it'd be a great idea if he started putting up you know photos of them almost as trophies and. Christ, somebody must have been listening in on my thoughts because they started doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's cool. I love that and how he puts little drugs. Like, so I like the little things. I'm almost just afraid that you're going to stuff it down our throats because, oh, hey, they really like this. Let's give it to them more than they want. Well, it's going to be really interesting to see what they do if they put him over Rollins, which I think they should do. Just, I, they're, but they're, but at this they're stage, not going to not go into. Well, I mean, that's the thing. If he wins the belt and then they do the draft, then what if they move into SmackDown? Do you move Lesnar back to Raw? I mean, no, no, they, no. They want well, they want Lesnar for SmackDown, and there is talk and rumblings online that you will start seeing Lesnar weekly. Fox definitely is. Fox well, wants it, him. Back. But yeah, they it, want that connection to the it, UFC. It makes sense bad. too. But I'm thinking if you get both him and Bray over to SmackDown because they want to load that roster up. Yeah, but then I mean, what do you do with Raw if you take the Fiend and Brock over there? And I mean, I don't want Brock. Doing the fiend. I don't want those two interacting in any shape. Oh, or no, form. I want Brock on the Firefly Funhouse. Yeah. I want him in there. No, I mean, that. I just. Brock is. It's such a, uh, a thing based in realism that it's like, you know, you put him in with the Firefly, and I just don't think that he'll be able to, no. to sell the effect. Like Seth, when. Yeah. You know, that image that was online of him being like, ooh, yeah, scared Colin, out of his sure. mind. You know, well, like. Brock would laugh. Yeah. Brock would be like, you know, come on. Like, yeah. the, the, that was the whole thing with him and The Undertaker was, I'm not afraid of your mystique. Yeah. So, all of a sudden, now he's afraid of The Fiend? Like, it, you it, know. It's going to yeah. be really interesting to see what they do with the draft. But, I mean, moving forward into Hell in a Cell coming up, Bray is going in with a lot of momentum. And yeah. for Braun, though, I don't know. Els. Yeah. It, it's just really interesting to see where he is going to go, too, because – Coming off the big loss against Seth Rollins and just having him get handled by Bray Wyatt. And it's so crazy because Vince's whole MO, his whole life, has been big monsters. Yeah. Sure. You would have thought that Braun would have been a three time champion by now. Yeah. Should have been. So who knows what they're going to wind yeah. up doing. But I think for him, though, I don't want to say get him off TV for a while, but can you imagine him running around crazy down in NXT? Oh, God. And make that his show? <sighs> oh, God. I definitely. I mean, well, he's I Braun Strowman Walter ver Braun yeah. Strowman versus Walter versus Pete Dunne, please. Give me that all day. I, Throw on Keith Lee too, maybe. I <sighs> I think that Braun getting some time away would probably like Finn Balor. You know, having this time off, I think would be refreshing because yeah. Finn's character was getting there too. You know, to the point where it's in the it was drop just, zone. Yeah, where it was just L's just because he was over enough well, that it, the it L wouldn't it affect was, him. It was L's and just everybody waiting for the next Fiend. Uh, demon uh, appearance right well and that's another thing with the fiend character is the you know the demon character right it would just it but no, yeah. fit. I mean, for finn it was kind of like all right everyone's just kind of holding over all right when are we going to see the demon king next you know all right uh, we're not seeing him this week well he might lose and i mean with braun it's like it's the same thing it's like you know maybe some time away would it would and bringing him back hot yeah. you know like a, even if you just i mean two months bring him back at the rumble yeah and yeah. let him just wreak havoc on that rumble Maybe not win, but wreak havoc. That would be refreshing. Yeah. Or even put him with the OC and just let his true personality come oh through. Oh, God. Oh, God. Yeah. I thought of that idea, too. <laughs> Some real deliverance style stuff. <laughs> That's <laughs> throwing that out there, folks. <laughs> him bring that banjo down there. Him oh, going. Him, you just imagine him going crazy with Gallows and Anderson. Oh, my God. I the need Stone this. Cold voices would be yeah. insane. They'd be doing it so much. I need this. I need this in my life. But we'll have to see what happens. I mean, Raw was coming, you know, dare I say, the wrestling was coming off very well. But yeah. I think with storyline purposes, they got some work to do. Obviously, going into SmackDown this week, a little more carryover is going to happen, and then NXT yeah. is going to really set up the tone for the big show next week. So we'll definitely have to deep dive into that preview on next week's episode. But let us know what you think. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH. What was your take on the wrestling action this weekend? We want to know. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Yeah. Hey, this is Johnny Moose from Excite Wrestling, and you're listening to the ODPH. I didn't mess it up. I thought I would. Right now, back to the guys. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH pad. Kick us off with that local minute. Local minute, of course, ever closer to the Binghamton uh, Devils coming back. More information, uh, BinghamtonDevils.com. But... 
Almost slipped by. Almost forgot it. Got to give a shout out to the Broom County Stallions. All right, uh, going winning the 2019 NFA Double A Championship. So congratulations to those guys uh, defeating. Uh, let's see who is it here. Upstate the Upstate Predators by a final score of 16 to eight. I know a couple people on the team. They are getting the rings and they are very nice. Yes, they are doing semi pro football. Yes, correct. So congratulations to the Stallions on a great season and getting yeah. the chip. Yeah, uh, awesome news to hear. Yeah, great. Good to them, Coach and. Uh, not only are, is it almost devil season, but the Bulldogs are right around the corner as yes. well. Uh, they have their annual red and white exhibition game on Friday, October 11th at St. Patrick's at 8 p.m. Tickets are a discounted $5 up until September 30th, and the price goes up to $8 thereafter. Uh, I mean, obviously, they've been releasing the 16-player uh, training roster okay. going into training camp and then from there i believe they're going to carry 11 this year so it'll be your chance to see and predict who will make the team going into the year sure so definitely more information on that binghamton bulldogs.com or their facebook page yes that's probably the most active yeah, yeah facebook they're very very active on so we recommend that here at the odph and to close out the local minute mm-hmm. we have to give a shout out to johnny moose and team yeah. excite they did mention on last week's podcast on the entertainment edition that they had some exciting news to drop over the weekend, and boy, did they ever. In spades. Yes. They are now moving their base of operations to the Oakdale Mall in Johnson City, New York, if mm-hmm. you are listening from out of town. Tremendous. Tremendously big news they're moving Huge. into, according to what I'm reading off, ExciteWrestling.com, the 6,000-square-foot entertainment complex will be known as the Excite Wrestling Exhibition Hall. Okay. So now this will be housing all of the Excite Wrestling cards starting up and the new improved Excite Training Center. So this is a huge, huge, huge move mm-hmm. for the team, for Johnny Moose, Sean Carr, uh, Sean Shea, and everybody involved at, with what's going on with Excite. They have huge news coming out more up in the upcoming months. I mean, we really only have a little bits and details, but the fact that they're now going to be in the mall, yeah. permanent location, yeah. and they're going to be doing it almost appears as monthly shows. That's what it's looking like, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Which is a huge, huge thing, and we're so happy for those guys, too. I mean, Team Excite works their tails off, and this is just uh, such a big commitment in providing an entertainment and you know everything that's going to come with this hall too is going to yeah. be a big deal. So obviously, stay tuned to ExciteWrestling.com for more information or on Excites Wrestling, uh, their social media too. Because I mean they're going to be posting stuff as soon as they do it. So I wouldn't doubt we hear something relatively sooner than later. So yeah. shout out to all those guys and you know keep up the good work. And you know their first card they're going to have at the mall. They're going to go all out. Oh yes, no gonna, pun intended. They're going to go all out. Nothing to do with AEW. No, we want to clarify that though. But it's as they said on their Facebook page. Uh, you know, if if you don't think they're going to have a big show for their first card in the mall, you haven't been paying attention the last few years. Yeah, they're going to go as full all in as they can. Yes. So let's go around those bases quick before we lock and leap. Sure. Uh, I'll start off here. Of course, we are in the final week of the season for Major League Baseball before we hit the playoffs. Uh, Looking at the standings, the New York Yankees have clinched the American League East Division for the first time since 2012. Long time coming. Right on, right on. Third year in a row they're making the playoffs. Uh, The Minnesota Twins are currently leading in the AL Central Division. Uh, They have a four-game lead on the Cleveland Indians, so not all said and done there, but it's looking like they'll probably clinch. Uh, in the American League West, the Houston Astros have clinched the uh, that division for the third year running. Uh, switching over to the National League East, the Atlanta Braves have won the National League East for the second year in a row. Uh, the In the National League Central, the St. Louis Cardinals have clinched a playoff berth but have not won the division yet. They are uh, three and a half games ahead of Milwaukee. Uh, and then over in the National League West, the L.A. Dodgers have clinched the, the division out there. Uh, and switching over to the wild cards uh, in the American League, your two leaders in the American League wild card are the Oakland A's and the Tampa Bay uh, Rays. But I should note that the Rays only have a half-game lead on the Cleveland Indians. Are And you got to get percentage points with this. Uh, the uh, Tampa Bay Rays have a w- uh, winning percentage of 592. Cleveland has a winning percentage of 590. So percentage points, it's going to get right down to the wire uh, as as the season goes on, the season ends here. And then switching over to the National League, uh, you've got the Washington Nationals in first place in the, for the first spot in the National League wild card. And then you've got the Milwaukee Brewers in the second wild card spot, and they are currently four games ahead of the Chicago Cubs for the uh, second wild card spot. And one quick thing other for baseball, uh, there is, of course, a 
uh, managerial position open with the San Diego Padres. Uh, former manager Bruce Bochy, who is, uh, as we record, we think is still retiring. Mm-hmm. That's what he said, and he said this is going to be his last year. But when asked if he would consider taking the San Diego Padres job because he did manage them uh, before he managed the San Francisco Giants, he was noncommittal. So mm-hmm. who, who knows? You might see a return for him. And then I got to give a salutations and a send off to. Uh, Oh, Cleveland, uh, or excuse me, Kansas City Royals manager Ned Yost, who is retiring after the season, 65 years old, uh, managed the Milwaukee Brewers from 2003 to 2008, and then from 2012 to the present, managed the Kansas City Royals and uh, won a World Series with the Royals as manager. Playoff baseball is such a wild time, yes. too. So, Coach, I know you're not a baseball guy, and what is your opinion on the wild card, though? Do you think it's a great thing for baseball, or do you think no? I am for it. I think, I mean, with 32 teams, and I mean, what was it? Only four were making the playoffs before? I mean, five. Five? That's, five or six, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm all for getting more teams in the playoff. It, it Not only does it create more revenue for the athletes, which is already ungodly in baseball, but it also just creates more opportunities to, to watch the sport and everything. And when you have as many teams as you have, I mean, it's like, why not let eight? 10 teams in the playoffs, you know? It, it also makes for some exciting scenarios. Like we had a couple of years ago where I forget what year it was, where you had like the Yankees and Rays were playing and then the Red Sox and the, and the uh, excuse me, Orioles were playing and like half of the country was paying attention to that because it had playoff implications, yet it was like the final game of the year. Yeah, when you get more fans invested in your sport, I think it's always a good thing. Yeah. And to see what they've done with the wild card rule, I think it's always been something that at first was kind of looked at and going, eh, why? Because baseball has such you know a rich tradition yeah, of right. you know, following their rules and such. To see the wild card get added, it gives the teams that are just on the cusp something to play for. Mm-hmm. And definitely you want to see the best competition going into your final weeks. Yeah. Because you hate going to games that teams have already clinched and they're not playing their stars. And yeah. You know, as a fan, you want to see the stars every time. I'll say there were a number of years when the Yankees had already clinched the playoff spot or won the division that you know Joe Torre would let the players manage. Right. You know, there, there was one year I remember Jorge Posada managed the final game of the year because, hey, we got nothing to play for. Exactly. So, I mean, that's one side of winning, and, you know, you, you get to have some fun like that. Sure. But for the teams that are just on the cusp, though, I think it's a brilliant thing, and yeah. I think it's something to generate more eyes on the sport. So I'm all for it. Uh, Yankees and Dodgers, Yankees and seven, early prediction. All right. Boom. All right, so – let us get into some more running those bases, Coach. Yeah, uh, so the uh, as I talked about last week, the Premier Lacrosse League wrapped up their season last week with a thrilling overtime winner. Uh, the season started um, in overtime with the first game, and it ended in overtime uh, with the Whip Snakes beating the Redwoods 12-11. to uh, The season was tremendous. Uh, Paul Rabel, uh, one of the co-founders of the league, talked about how the numbers – uh, had beaten the expectations at NBC as far as uh, ad revenue and uh, sales for the NBC app, which is what you know they use to stream a lot of the games. So, I mean, that's great to see that the growth of the game is there, the demand for the game is there. So hopefully next year uh, they're talking about potential expansion. They're talking about hosting uh, games at different sites next year. Uh, so that would be tremendous as far as uh, growth from the league standpoint. And, you know, all in all, I mean, I was very happy with the on-field product. I mean, they tried to do some different things as far as uh, a shorter shot clock and a, a smaller field. Instead of using 110, they only used 100, which you wouldn't think would adjust the game a lot, but it actually did. It made uh, the faster players even quicker, uh, and it made for uh, shorter transitions as far as offense to defense. And, you know, all in all, I think it's a great thing that this is going to be a a player-ran league, a player-friendly league, and, uh, you know, the sky's the limit. When you talk about the fact that there's already another professional league and this one was able to exceed the numbers that they had with NBC, and I wish that they would release the ratings that they had for the championship game that was aired on NBC, the first lacrosse game to ever be broadcasted on national television, you know, not just ESPN, this is NBC. I mean, this is a... Uh, you know, a non-cable subscription needed network to, mm-hmm. you know, have a lacrosse game on. So, uh, you know, it's great. I look forward to next year, you know, uh, six long months without lacrosse right now. So I can't wait to see what they'll do, you know, in the in the coming year with the next season. Right on. The PLL has got a bright future, so hopefully they can continue rolling that success. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's great. You know, I mean, it's nice that there's another professional league out there that can be successful, and especially being a startup, you know, it's not easy to branch in that market. 
and they were able to do it, you know? Yeah, so definitely congratulations. I'm on a great season and yeah. hopefully a bright future moving forward. Going into my last base here, the UFC had an event down in Mexico City. Oh, boy, it was an event. It was an event. Uh, obviously, the main event did not go the way the fans wanted. Memorable for all the wrong reasons. Yes, Yair Rodriguez was facing Jeremy Stevens in a featherweight bout, and due to an accidental eye poke, mm -hmm. eye scratch it more looked like, yeah. uh, Jeremy Stevens was unable to compete, and yeah. they had to stop the fight immediately. He could yeah. not open his eye. Well, they didn't stop the fight immediately, so there was a, there was a, clearly something happened with Jeremy Stevens' eyes, and he was kind of grasping at him, and Herb Dean, the ref, stopped the match and was looking at him, and he was trying to look at his eyes, and if you can find the video, you can see what I'm talking about. He was trying to see what exactly was going on with his eye, but and he tried to uh, pull apart his eyelid to look at it, but the muscle was just fighting him the entire time so he gave him the allotted five minutes to kind of look because like all right listen your your eye and your body's kind of freaking out right now let's let it calm down and then let's try and look the allotted five minutes passed and it still wouldn't open so they had to immediately call it because well they're not going to let a fighter fight with one eye right and if anybody was questioning stevens about this you obviously have not been watching the fight game he is all heart he would have right. fought he probably would have tried fighting with one eye Right, and I know there were. There, I know there was a fair amount of chatter online that oh, he was faking it. This and yeah, really bull crap. Bull crap. Because there was a video posted to his social media after the after the fights were over because he ended up having to go to the hospital for this. That it was basically him with uh, uh, bandages over said eye, and he had sunglasses on. And bear in mind, this was at the middle of the night when this yeah. was going on. And then obviously we were hearing about. I mean, the po post fight, Yair Rodriguez was very emotional in the cage. Sure, sure. And I know that there was a little verbal. You know, barrage against Bisbing, who was doing the commentary, and I heard about you know maybe some altercation going on on Sunday. I'm trying to get official reports if there was like a brief. Uh, yeah, I heard. I heard yeah. about something like that. Yeah. yeah, so they're going to obviously reschedule this fight uh, as soon as they can, and I will give some advice to Mr. Rodriguez. You have now ticked off Jeremy Stevens. He is going to run right through you. Uh huh. I, let's not get it twisted. He is going to come in there and throw some hands. Look out. It's going to be a long day for you, sir. Yeah, just not a good look for Mexico City because, it, you know, you had the whole incident with the main event, and that wasn't the only thing. There were some other incidents that took place with, with fighters coming down to the ring. I mean, Carla Esparza uh, said that when she was coming out for her fight, uh, she got beer poured on her. So uh, not a good look. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, that's just not fair for the, the competitors to have to yeah. walk into that kind of environment. It's certainly unjustified. I mean, yeah. I understand that you paid your money and that you're probably not going to get it back, but at the end of the day, you know, you can't control those circumstances. So why right. conduct yourselves right. in that manner? I mean, yeah. the main event, they had they were rushing. I think it was Stevens out of the ring when they were covering him in Duffy. I know you both will get this. It reminded me of uh, Detroit and Indiana, Malice at the Palace. And right. like yeah. covering guys, running them out of there. That like yeah. It reminded me. It was That's, just not good. There's no sense and no need for it. No, we understand that as fans, we get very emotional about our teams yeah. and about fighting. And I mean, I'll be the first to admit, like I get very animated when I start watching fights. But still, I've never had the inclination to start throwing bottles or whatever at the cage, no, no like, matter like what. Michael Bisping clearly said on the commentary, and you can find clips of it, that he got hit with a bottle of Modelo. Yeah, so not the best look for the fans of that night. It shouldn't be a representation of all MMA fans. No. And I think it's going to be a while before the UFC books another fight in Mexico City after that. Yeah. And obviously, justifiably so. So let's get into those locks and leaps, shall we? Pad, you want to kick us off? Sure, I'm going to start with my lock. I'm looking at the, uh, uh, excuse me, I almost said St. Louis, the uh, L.A. Rams going up against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, currently, as we record, the Rams are favored by 10 points. I think L.A. is on a bit of a roll in Tampa Bay. Yeah, they had that game against the Giants, but you know where they almost won. But you know, uh, the L.A. Rams are not the New York Giants. Uh, Fair they're, enough. They're, they're, I get the feeling they're going to struggle against them. And then switching over to my leap, looking at the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars and Denver Broncos matchup. Uh, currently, Denver is a three-point favorite. Uh, the game is in Denver. I, I'm going to go with uh, Jacksonville on this one. Okay, fair point. Uh, my lock is going to be the Baltimore Ravens Ooh. taking on the Cleveland Browns. Okay. They are seven-point favorites right now. I'm playing in Baltimore. Okay. I think the talk of, you know, Cleveland being the class of that division – you know, how Cleveland was going to run away with it, and I know that I said they were going to, too. Mm. Uh, we all did. Yeah, we yeah. all did. I think Cleveland right now is a, is a team with uh, – talk about a team without identity. You know, o Odell Beckham said it himself that they don't have an identity right now. But on the other side of that ball, Baltimore does have that identity. Say, it's, yes. it's, it's like the saying goes, they're playing with house money. You know, before Big Ben went down, you know, everyone's figuring it's either going to be Cleveland or Pittsburgh. Nobody was really counting – unless you're in, you know, the, the state of Maryland. You know, nobody was really counting on Baltimore to do anything, and they're like, hey – Nobody's betting on us. Let's go. 
and they're definitely going to, and they're going to lay the pipe. I yeah. think they're mm-hmm. definitely looking for to to make a statement. W- especially, uh-huh. win. Yeah, especially after a close Kansas City game. Yeah, you know that they played well in for the most part. I think they're going to want to show that they are the class of the division. Mm-hmm. And my leap is going to be the Tennessee Titans. Ooh. Ah, Mr. Mr. Ken over there with the same idea. I think, obviously, from our conversation earlier, uh, Atlanta, you know, is a team that's on tilt right now, and I think Tennessee is going to be able to take advantage of them in an opportune time. I mean, you talk about Tennessee being one and two. Yeah. They do a couple things well that, you know, Atlanta doesn't do well against, and that's run the ball <laughs> and play very good defense. Mm-hmm. And I think Tennessee is going to be able to take advantage of that and uh, be able to control the clock and win this game outright. Coach took my leap, and all the points I was going to say, you just said. Hey, so great, hop on with me. Yeah, great minds think right, alike. So yeah. right. uh, but for my lock, no, I am not taking the Chargers going to Miami. In fact, I'll even make a very bold statement. Okay. The Chargers might win that game, but they will not cover the spread. Okay. Okay. I will, I will I say this. See, I could definitely see that. This, to me, has trap game written all over it for the Chargers. Could be. And I'm saying I'm not saying Miami is going to win, but I say the score is going to be a lot closer than it should be. So what you're saying is they're not going to get blown out by 40. No, um, I could honestly see this being a six point win for the Chargers. Don't get me wrong, uh, with Philip Rivers being my starter in fantasy, I'd love a blowout win. Oh, I'm sure they should do it, but they have been known in the past the Chargers for whatever reason when they have to travel to the East Coast against a lesser yeah. quality team. Yeah, sometimes Looking they fumble. Past them. They look past them. I think this might be one of those situations where they should blow them out by about 50, but they're yeah. only going to win by six. Yeah, it could be. So I will give that fair warning. And no, I'm not taking my Buffalo Bills as a, as a, <laughs> as a leap. Because, listen, I, I want to see how they stack up against the Patriots. Patriots are the class of the division. I know. I wanted to, I wanted to do the Giants game. I just, you, you know, you, I, yeah, you just, just can't do it. You, you can't know? do it. And like I say, I'm rooting for my team. but And I'm trying to win this locks and lead, baby. Yeah. I'm trying to win this. Competition is fierce. If you're not following us on Facebook, get involved because it's always tweeted at the or posted at the top of the page of who's winning. Ron from 3FN is coming alive, too. Okay. He's got some co- we got some competition here. But, no, my lock this week is going to be the Houston Texans at home I against Carolina. Yeah, I, you know, I looked at that, too. It, it, it's probably the safest pick. I mean, you know, yeah. Carolina, we don't know. I mean, obviously they had a good game last week. Played very well yeah. against a very yeah. bad Arizona team. Yeah, yeah, but you faced a bad Arizona team. The yeah. Houston team is a very different story on the side of defense. This is true. So it's going to be interesting to watch on that aspect. But I'll say that Carolina offense had a little bit of a – of a identity and was able to get some rhythm. Yeah. You know, right. without, you know, obviously, like we talked about last show, Cam Newton, we were right. Our prediction was right. He's been playing hurt. Mm-hmm. And, uh-huh. you know, finally Worst that injury, injury. Yeah. The, obviously, that injury now panning out to the point where he can't play with it anymore. And I mean, right. and probably been, best for him and the team. And like we, like I said earlier in the show, he has been, uh, he has already been listed as not playing uh, this coming Sunday. Right. So, Carolina, a little uncertainty there, but I think Houston should yeah. be able to handle it and win by a touchdown. Early prediction. Okay. So before we close out the show, a couple quick shouts that we have to make. One, we are featured on the Book of Lies podcast this week on their promo, so shout out to them. Check them out. We also have con season kicking off this weekend as well. So Friday nights, September 27th, Galaxy Brewing Company. Shout of the Robots, Floodlands, Brian, and Zero Mean. There's been a new band added to the show. Okay. All playing a Galaxy Brewing Company, kicking off the con season uh, tour, I guess you could say, for all of the Hashtag 607 podcasts. Uh, five dollar covered to get in. Doors open at seven. Show starts at eight. More information. We have that posted on our social media accounts, and we've been sharing it all week. But we'll just say go to Floodlands homepage to find out more information on the show. Saturday and Sunday, twenty eighth, twenty ninth, we are at Robercon. Hey, eleven o'clock in the morning. We are doing <gasps> the MCU panel. And we are recording it live. We are not editing it. Once it's done, we are posting it live to the show. So you'll be able to hear all the screw-ups I make. I okay. might drop an F-bomb. Or, or wait, 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 you say we're not editing it. Moose is on this panel, right? I know. Oh, Lord. I'm going to let Moose swear first, and I'm going to go second. We're going to go live. Johnny Moose is joining us. Bright Guy Signal from the Comics Blog is coming. Coach Duffy is gracing us with his presence. Let's go. And Pat and I are going to be there. We're talking yep. MCU, everything you need to know about. We are recording it live for everybody. Following us is the 8122 Productions Presents. And that's what I'm calling it because it's all three fat nerds, Rich, Ron, and hashtag Big Natty Cool Diesel, with Mike C. from Horizon 607 there doing their panel. It, I mean, is Big Natty Cool going to be sober? Well, he does have a gimmick he does portray, so <laughs> I am wondering if he's going to come is in. the gimmick real life? 
you, that you'll have to find out. You're gonna have to find out because he might come in like the Sandman from ECW. Oh God! With, oh, God. with, oh, with, with a natty. So I know Rich and Ron and Diesel are listening to the show. I'm throwing that idea out. If you want to try doing that reenactment, please for the show. You've now been challenged. So that is going on during the day at night, which I forgot to mention last week, and I do apologize for this. We are having the AfterCon party oh. at Dragon Master Games. Yeah, Shout at the Robots is doing double duty this weekend, and they're playing a free show at Dragon Master Games, kind of capping off the big weekend for us at Robocon. So definitely come down and check that out. There's more information on the 3FN page, our page as well. We Everybody's been sharing it. So Dragon Master Games on Saturday night. And then Sunday, 11 a.m., Rich... From 3FN, Mike C. and myself are doing the podcast workshop at Robocon. And then 2 p.m., Brian and I are crashing the DC TV Universe panel mm-hmm. at Robocon. So we're going to shut that down before Pat, myself, Brian, John, and Brian take off to New York for New York Comic Con. Yep. And that is going down. 3FN is going to be taking off to Sci-Fi and Horror Fest. And then they're taking off to Scaricon right after. And then... The next time we're going to be back local and touring, BroomCon in May 2020. Mm -hmm. I think I covered everything. I think so. If not, we got to get a calendar set up on our page. I know 8122productions.com has one for all of the shows on that uh, calendar or for their group. They're all posted on there, so we might have to get one set up too because I'm losing track of everything we're doing. It's going to be a crazy two months, but it's going to be so good. Expansion. Exactly. And then who knows what's going to be coming. Maybe we'll have some more exciting news. Mm. I don't know. But that is literally all I have for this week. So for Coach Duffy. Good night. And Daniel Jones. For Padawan J. Thank you. Thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Let's close you out with some Fair City Fire. You can hear them on uh, OchoDuroParlayHour.com under the music section and check them out at FairCityFire.com. So let's close it out. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking sports locally and nationally. Join the conversation on our social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Here we go.